It is my honor to introduce our fourth speaker this afternoon. And I have the pleasure of introducing Thomas H. Beebe. Thomas Beebe's large portfolio of work includes significant new cultural, academic, religious, residential, and commercial buildings, and additions in historic settings. One of the Chicago 7 group of postmodern architects who challenged the modernist orthodoxy in the 70s and the 80s, he helped to bring traditional architecture and urban design back into the public consciousness. Reflecting on the group's influence in 2005, Chicago Tribune architecture critic Blair Kamen commended the, quote, critical spirit that helped the Chicago 7 alter the course of the city's architecture. In recognition of Tom's role in modern architecture's return to classical and traditional design principles, he was recently named the 2013 recipient of the Richard H. Driehaus Prize. It's my pleasure to introduce Tom Beebe and his talk, Chicago, the City as a Work of Art. Thank you very much. And thank you for asking me to speak here today. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is all work done in Chicago. And um, it has to do with the, the evolution of the city and the, the building of a public realm and uh, an attempt to, to make um, a kind of coherent public uh, presence in the city. Um, so with that, I think I should start. Chicago, sort of a brief history. Um, Chicago, very early on, was, was, became a kind of commerce center because in the 17th century, the French discovered that if you went down Lake Michigan and you went up the um, Chicago River, you could only had to carry a canoe for eight miles. You can get on a, at that point on a river going west and you could go to the Mississippi. So it was obviously a link between, a water link between the East Coast and the Gulf of Mexico and Chicago um, capitalized on that by, by ensuring the, um, the railhead when it came through going west by hook or crook. And the city was platted. Uh, every inch was for sale, more or less. Um, and out of that grew this kind of amazing uh, uh, buildings that grew up. On the left is the Richardson Building from 1885, which is Marshall Field wholesale store. Uh, commerce was a big thing because of the railroad. On the right is the, the uh, packing town, which is where all the meat packing was done, where they figured out they could send ice-contained uh, ice cars east and, and capture the entire meat market for the east coast from Chicago. So they're very inventive, um, uh, very successful sort of businessmen, and it was a very uh, uh, rapidly growing city. Um, out of that, on the right is Packingtown. This is, um, you can see that actually the mills beyond that, uh, groups of ethnic groups moved to Chicago. Uh, they competed for, for the work. Uh, the, the, they were manipulated by the owners of the mills in order to keep the cost of labor down. There was serious labor issues in Chicago. Uh, May Day, as you might know, is in honor of um, the Haymarket Riot in Chicago, which was a major sort of uprising of the people. Um, on the left is uh, one of the armors houses, the, one, of the, one of the families that owned uh, one of the meatpacking houses. They, they amassed enormous amounts of wealth. So the Chicago, as it developed, you had these kind of neighborhoods. Uh, you had the downtown with its commercial buildings, which became quite famous. And you had uh, the people who owned these enterprises who eventually moved as far away from the working class people as possible. However, they became a kind of source of money to actually build of the public sector here because there's no platted land for, for museums and things at the, at the origins of the city and so that became an issue for architects. Um, here are two, two um, illustrations of, of urban ideas. On the left you have the Burnham Plan. Burnham Plan took the grid of Chicago, which you can see here. There were a series of roads that went into the center of the city which were actually old Indian trails uh, they remained as streets and became sort of very vibrant uh, transport, tra transport systems. Uh, Burnham overlaid that, uh, a circular system around that to gather traffic, uh, and then he built a major boulevard down the middle. 
Uh, he designed a city hall, which he'd hoped to acquire someday as a commission. And he was going to put the Field Museum uh, right here, which was the first store we saw the owner, Marshall Field, uh, was going to build a museum. M museums are going to flank this. And there was a park that extended along the lakefront, which extended uh, north and south along the shore of the city. So this produced a vision like this, which is quite clear. It's based on European precedent. Uh, the commercial core was going to be built up with buildings of equal height. So, so the, the, the streets ran through, the grid ran through, the, the cornices were even. You'd carve out public space like this, which didn't exist at that time. There was no public space of a ceremonial nature. The city hall was here, and then other government buildings were gathered around it. The railroad stations were gathered into a, a kind of plaza area here. And then the existing grid and the diagonal streets ran through it. Uh, it was a very kind of coherent vision, and, and the whole idea of the lakefront uh, was uh, immediately sort of embraced by the people of Chicago. The World's Fair had already happened, so they had a notion of what this was all about. Um, the alternate vision on, on, on this side is by Ludwig Hilbersheimer, who came with Mies van der Rohe uh, in 1939 to Chicago. It's the same, you can see the center of the city here, which exists here. Uh, Hilbersheimer essentially eradicated the city as, as, a, as a way of dealing with it. You have greenways what, which run through the city. The existing railroad tracks you can see are on both plans. And then when you look at a sector of, of a typical Hilbersheimer part of the city, you see that there's greenways that run through, cul-de-sac streets, so people never have to walk uh, across streets where cars are. You gather all the public transport and the highways into, into throughway systems like this. They're um, surrounded by uh, commercial activities uh, that, that ran along there. And in the open spaces where these walkways went to were the public schools and the recreational spaces. So here you have two artistic ideas of the city. Uh, in this case, you have a hierarchical arrangement of pieces over the grid, which gives kind of an order to the system. And it's based entirely on European uh, precedents. So you have here Chicago trying to establish an architectural language that would give it the kind of grandeur of a European city because it really had none of that. Uh, and it's, it's an entirely intellectual and artistic construct. And here you have a European arriving later and uh, going to tear down the whole city and rebuild it in a new way. So these are obviously conflicting ideas. You have freestanding buildings sitting in open space in this plan. You have form space here, which has to do with civic uh, pre presence. And they, they remain the, these two kind of uh, ideas of the city uh, exist to this day. Um, the, the city itself developed. There's no, there no problem of developing architectural language. Chicago is actually very, very adept at making language. This is a Burnham and Root Monadnock Stair, which is a Romanesque revival. This is uh, the, the pavilion from the World's Fair by Burnham and Atwood. And it shows a uh, kind of very elongated uh, uh, classical columns, um, exposed construction, support systems, a glass roof with a kind of scrim underneath it, uh, in, in an attempt to make a temporary uh, art museum. You have, around the same time as the Burnham Plan, Louis Sullivan, this is the bank in Owatonna, developing a kind of architecture which is based on walls with ornamentation as a major part of the whole uh, intellectual construct. Here you have the same architect, uh, doing the frame, the kind of iconic frame of Chicago. Uh, in uh, uh, 1890, the, it ran over a period of time, the building of this building, but I think 1890 is the first, the first phase of it. You have here in 1962, the frame again by C.F. Murphy, uh, after the arrival of Mies and Mies's very sort of spare language of steel detailing, you have this idea carried through in a kind of continuum. In the meantime, you have Frank Lloyd Wright. This is the, the window from the the Coonley House, uh, Gardner's House, which is an amazing sort of abstract uh, sort of composition. And here you have Priscilla and Emsley, one of the Prairie Style architects, uh, developing that as an interior commercial space. So you have a plethora of languages here uh, uh, that were developed in Union Chicago during this period of time. Um, now, the first pro project I'm going to show you today is, is we worked on the Art Institute. So th this is sort of the basic background of the Art Institute. This is the 1836 survey of Chicago. This is the original survey here. All these further lots were planted in a later date. And this, on the front of, of this down here, you can see here there's a public ground which occurred on the first survey the federal government did. 
So this is a, a piece of land along the lakefront which is supposed to stay open and clear forever. You can never build on it. You can't build any structures on this piece of land. It's very clear. So the Iron Institute starts uh, on Michigan Avenue on the west side of Michigan Avenue. And this is the, this is the park evolving this point. Most of the city in 1871 burned down. All this section here burned down completely. The debris from the fire was pushed out of the lake and, and formed this landfill which became the Lakefront Park. And in 1892, at the time of the World's Fair, uh, they built, uh, the Iron Institute moved from here across the street uh, into the park, which is essentially uh, an, illegal, uh, an illegal move. They, they, there was a, a, a legal uh, operation that occurred that, that made that valid. Um, and, uh, and they got through these, the, the whole issue of whether you could build a structure on the other side of the lake or not. Montgomery Ward, who was a, a great competitor of Marshall Field, um, for, had lawsuits to stop people from building on the park. And the Air Institute, by having, having uh, very smart lawyers and a very influential board, managed to get their building on the other side by getting the permission of everybody along this whole wall, or at least facing the site, to actually approve, approve their building. Um, at the time, I was working uh, uh, on my own, and uh, I'd been at CF Murphy. I'd been teaching at IIT, so I actually knew Mises architecture quite, quite well. I, I was working in, in Crown Hall as a teacher. I was interested in, in sort of the basis of Mises, the Schinkel buildings. This is a Schinkel um, villa here. I, and on, the, on getting the commission for the Art Institute, I was interested in actually, because the Art Institute was an entirely classical building, of somehow developing a kind of classical architecture, classical-based architecture that would somehow form a link between, uh, between uh, Schinkel and, and Mies, because I knew that uh, Mies's architecture obviously had a basis in that work. Uh, in the process, I discovered uh, works in Germany. This is the Wegen House by Peter Behrens. Peter Behrens was an employer of Mies, and this house has a very sort of abbreviated uh, neoclassical system of detailing in it. We've always been very interested in, in detail, uh, and uh, I was interested in, in how you would evolve uh, out of a Mies uh, back into a sort of more Grecian kind of architecture. So this pavilion on the front of the vagant house is an open kind of pavilion piece that has a very kind of spare classical detail in it. So I was interested in this. I was also interested in the grid system that uh, had been applied on this house by Barron's as a, as a proportioning device. The grid obviously is, the, is one of the bases of Mises' work, and I was trying to figure out a way that somehow the rational aspects of Mises building Haiku to actually incorporate it into a more sort of fully developed architectural language. Uh, there's a, it was all based on, on um, Greek precedent. Uh, this actually is a, is, a, is a building that Schinkel had studied. Uh, so there was, I was interested in sort of a dialogue between uh, the, the past that would go from, from Mies to to, to Barons, to Schinkel, to Greece, right? So that was sort of the idea. Uh, we did a lot of research into detailing at this point and ornamentation. These are actually the, the Barons' details, photographs of them. It's very kind of spare, almost modern kind of uh, interpretation of classicism. Uh, we didn't use any of this directly. Uh, I was just interested in the mechanism that would allow you to do this kind of transformation. So when we started working on the job, the Art Institute is an interesting sort of history. This is the first pavilion I showed you earlier. There's a park on each side, uh, which were developed as part of the Grant Park uh, system, which is this open lakefront uh, property. They, the first addition, after they built the main building here, this has that glass roof over it. So you have a very light, sort of light court aspect at one end as a termination. They built Gonzalez Halls, which is a bridge over the railroad tracks. The Illinois Central Railroad has a, had an active line running through here. Uh, later on, you'll see more of that. They actually occupied a lot of the lakefront. Eventually, Montgomery Ward sued them, and had, they had to tear down their station. So you have the very powerful people uh, involved in this whole process. The Art Institute obviously had very influential board members, too. They built McClinlock Court at the back as, a, as another light source. You had an access ramp between these two light sources. Our building, we, we built in here. We uh, developed an axis that would run this way here, which would allow you to extend uh, the, by having this one simple axis with a light cord at each end. Putting a light cord in here, we could actually run another axis this way when they're going to expand the museum at a later date. 
So the, the billing is, is very sort of simple structure. All of the columns which are actually expressed as classical columns are actually structural columns. The rest are embedded in walls. And it's a, it's a straight sort of uh, symmetrical plan, very simple. It has temporary exhibit at the end, a very large open space for, for large exhibits. We convinced the Art Institute to build a facade on, on the south end of the park at Jackson Park, so it had a kind of civic presence previously. This had been a kind of service court in that area. And the section involved uh, a major light court for the top two floors and galleries below. And uh, the, the special exhibits down here more galleries down here and service spaces down here. So it was a three-story addition that attached at this level uh, to, the, to the, um, the, the access that came through Gonzales Hall. This is sections in the middle of the building with the light court. The building itself um, developed as a very kind of planar um, development of a classical language. Uh, it, it didn't actually fellows uh, Barron's uh, exact specifications at all is sort of developed by us. It's an Indiana limestone like the rest of the Art Institute. And we were very interested in having this facade because the grids that ran back into the city ran out into the park of having the, a kind of uh, street presence on Jackson Boulevard facing south. And this, this uh, entrance here could be opened for ceremonial events, but it was actually screened by walls, so it would never be mistaken as the primary entrance for the Art Institute. Um, the development of the wing inside, we entered mid-level because this was what had the large exhibits in it. The idea was to have um, uh, up a half a level and down a half a level so in large shows were going on, people could enter on one level and exit through the other. So you could move large groups of people through here. The Art Institute was interested in having uh, what the director at the time, Jim Wood, described as a, a true museum experience. So he developed a series of, of um, sort of traditional uh, uh, galleries in order to allow the, the person going to the big shows to actually have sort of what's termed as a real uh, uh, museum experience. This is the language at the lower level. Uh, the, it was very shallow, shallow sort of modeling, very simplified details. You can see the flatness of it all here. And these are uh, in the proportion of a structural column uh, more than, a, than the exact proportion of a classic column. So it's really a reinvention of a classical language uh, because when we examined the, the existing Art Institute, the languages that were there already in the existing wings were actually not that good and they weren't consistent. So the idea was to develop a language that would be compatible with the other languages in the, in the, in the, in the whole building, but an attempt to bring the entire institution into some sort of of mode which was recognizable and similar to, each part had a similarity to it. Um, this is the top lit galleries in the top floor uh, with, with coves which uh, allow for a good distrib distribution of life, of light. Off the sides, the, the deeper spaces had entry galleries that introduced you into other collections. This is at the level of the courtyard down here. Um, the special exhibits could be divided anyway. It was completely open, flexible space uh, with artificial lighting. And the lower level galleries were actually laid out by different, um, different designers who, do, who worked for different departments. So it had to be a completely flexible sort of modern uh, uh, museum space. Um, when we finish this, uh, this is, a, this is a, a 1929 photograph. Our edition uh, was in this area right in here. You can see the railroad tracks coming through here that divided the Iron Institute up. They're into a very large marshalling yard down here. Uh, and this is, shows 1991, uh, the same situation. There's still a, the marshalling yards are still down past the Art Institute. This is our wing in this in this position here. So the the idea of sort of finishing off the museum on that side, so it had a kind of civic presence on the park, um, setting up a system to allow for expansion of the museum on the other side. The one piece that actually isn't classical is this SOM addition uh, uh, that was done in the in the 70s which made no attempt to actually deal with classism at all. You can see the arrangement of, of the end of Congress Boulevard here, which is here and here. In the end, Montgomery Ward paid for, he personally paid for the entire planning of Grant Park, which is an enormous sort of endeavor, which he did as a sort of public, uh, a public um, gift. So the next thing we worked on, we do a lot of research in these projects to figure out sort of why things are the way they are. Uh, 
where there was a competition for the library in Chicago, that, and uh, it was named after the, the mayor, Harold Washington, who had died earlier, uh, a couple years earlier. And the, we were interested in the loop. This is actually in the center of the business district. So what we did is we looked at all the development over the years by, by very good architects over, over a long period of time to try to figure out what made sense uh, for us, uh, for a kind of language we were interested in. It was a historic district. We felt we had to somehow um, build a building that was compatible with the surroundings. So if you look at Chicago, 1881, the dates on these early buildings by by Burnham and Root and Adler and Sullivan, you find sort of very sort of util utilitarian buildings with more ornament in the case of Sullivan, less ornament here in terms of Burnham and Root. Uh, but they're actually, uh, they're, it's equipment for making money. They're actually not uh, architectural in, in, in a true architectural sense. And then 1885, uh, Richardson built this building, the one we saw earlier, the Marshall Field Wholesale Store. This is like a primary object. This is when all the other architects saw this, they immediately, the whole nature of the profession changed. So you have uh, Burnham and Root building the, the uh, rookery uh, with, uh, almost exactly the same time. They have heavy rusticated bases, arched openings in the, term, in, in, in the, in the, in the case of the, of the rookery, and a very kind of monumental presence. Um, Louis Sullivan, the auditorium is also about the same time, 1887. You have, again, the rusticated base the arcuated base bottom down here, the, the treatment of the facade as these large arched, op arched openings that have multiple floors, and a kind of pile up of tiers of, of um, windows that allow you to do uh, a fairly tall building with, with a uniform expression. The Walker Warehouse is one of the more uniform uh, buildings of this period, but the, obviously there's an enormous, um, enormous influence of, of Richardson on, on the development of architecture at this time. Uh, about the same time, uh, this is 93, slightly later, Halbert and Roche th th built the Marquette Building. The Marquette Building um, is like two blocks away from the site also. This develops frame expression uh, with columns. Uh, the Chicago windows, these aren't exactly typical Chicago windows. Usually you have a large window in the middle and two uh, operational windows in the side for ventilation. So this is, this is 1893. This is, again is 1962. This is kind of an insurance by C.F. Murphy. It's the office where I actually did my internship. And the, the inspiration of this kind of work on these kinds of architects is obviously quite clear, although it's like 70 years later. So this became sort of emblematic of what Chicago architecture was all about in, in terms of commercial buildings. In terms of public buildings in the loop, it's, it's, a, it's kind of a more interesting story. This is, this is the, the building that, that Burnham was trying to get to build down his, in, in his central space in the, in the city plan. This is now embedded in the grid of the, of the loop further to the north. And what Halliburton Roche did here is they took a sort of classical arrangement of the pieces with a base and a top and an attic story here, and they, and they jumped the scale. So you have this enormous scale granite elements that make up the architectural language of the building to express the fact that it's a public building. It isn't a frame building like the, the earlier buildings I show you. This is actually attempting to not look like a commercial building. You have the Federal Center, which um, has a base, and then on top of the figural building, uh, this is built in the 1890s also by Frost and Cobb, and there's, there's a, a temple uh, piece sitting on top of this plinth base, and it has a dome in the middle. So this is an attempt to maintain an idea of an open space, have a figural building, but you're still building out entirely to the out, outside part, the outside limits of the building area. Uh, in the 1960s, uh, this is a building by C.F. Murphy. Again, this is after Continental Insurance, the one I showed you earlier. This is the Civic Center. It has a very large span. So what, what, what Jack Bronson did, who designed this, he took the enormous scale introduced by this building. Actually, this is the Civic Center. The, the City Hall is right here in this position that faces the plaza. The Civic Center uses this large scale development, these like 80 foot bays in order to get the same expression of power and scale that was necessary to represent a public building within the grid of Chicago. Now, if we look at the site, immediately around the site, this building is a block away to the north. There's these walls of buildings. These, this is the Monadnock block, the last bearing wall building by, by, um, by Burnham and Root. This is the and Roche's addition. You have these walls, a very kind of solid building. Some of them have bay windows to introduce more light. 
This is on the other side of Dearborn, uh, facing these buildings, the Fisher Building by Burnham, Manhattan Block, the old Colony Building, which again, very sort of solid uh, uh, walls of buildings that are continuous faces. Um, now if we look at the site of the library competition, uh, this is Plymouth Court. The library is built just to the right of this. This is the back of the Manhattan Block, which we saw in the previous photograph. This is actually a service street. It's a secondary street. So the bottoms of a lot of these buildings have steel plate exteriors at the bottom because they had loading coming in through large doors in this area. Across the site, on the other side, this is State Street now. This is the, the second lighter building, which is a major sort of Jenny building. It's a department store. There's a whole series of department stores that run down State Street. This is the fair store, another one. These are all about the same height. This is the, the Sullivan uh, Carson Perry Scott building, which is a frame. Also, it has an ornamented base on it. So there's a fairly consistent row of buildings that run down each side of the site. And the library was right in the middle of it. So, you know, what to do, <laughs> what to do. So what we did is we decided to actually, um, this is the, the, the Jenny building here. This is the Manhattan block going back this way, the Dearborn Street corridor. This is State Street right here. So we tried to do <laughs> is to match the corner site here, which is actually required by the competition to match that. We built out to the property line all the way around so there would be uh, fill in the block. Since in Burnham's original plan, this would not have any open space around it. So the idea was to, to build it out to the limits and jump the scale, as I showed you earlier, and use a brick building. So there's a, a conscious attempt here to do a kind of hybrid of, of what Chicago had done. You have the situation of a commercial building in the, in the loop. It's the height of all the commercial buildings. And it uses the brick, which you find in the commercial buildings, and not stone, which was normal for public buildings. Up until this time, all of the public buildings in Chicago had been classical, and all the, the commercial buildings, which had re received all the attention by uh, modernists, had always liked the development of the commercial buildings. None of those architects had actually built those kinds of buildings as public buildings. So as you move around the building, this is Congress Street, which would be the main facade facing the major boulevard in, in Burnham's plan. This is uh, Plymouth Court back here. And you have Plymouth Court, which has this kind of proto curtain wall system, much like many of the early first Chicago schools had on the service side. There'd be no attempt to actually have a monumental facade on this side. And then you have the brick that occurs along Congress at that point. Um, as you move around the building, the base has the, a rusticated base uh, uh, as similar to the earlier buildings. It has the use of actually classical motifs instead of, instead of Romanesque. The idea was to somehow introduce the notion of it being a public building through the, through the manner which these are all, are all turned out. There's a series of garlands on the top. The windows are all tied together by another series of ornaments that runs down the minor, the minor windows at that point. The arched openings, again, are similar to the earlier First Chicago School, because what I'm trying to do here is to tie this whole district together, not to disrupt it, but actually tie it all together to knit it back together. So the development of this, we worked out a whole system of ornamentation in the stone. The, the very complex figural piece like this, we couldn't afford in stone. They're actually done in cast stone. Um, and then the pieces that are, are done linearly, you could actually, with a, with a new kind of cutting techniques, you could do that actually on, with, a, with a mechanized cutting system. The, the pieces that make up the outside, this is a Windy City figure, which is kind of an allegorical figure for Chicago. A garland that represents the, the kind of wealth of the Midwest, the produce that came out of the center of the country. Uh, and, and this is a series of the goddess of grain with corn, which was the major sort of product of the Midwest. So there's an attempt to make a kind of architectural language that speaks to people uh, because the idea of the library is, unlike their institute, which is obviously a museum, this is meant to be for the people of Chicago. So it's an attempt to make, to be something that's legible to them. This is the, the top of the building with the, with the garlands. There's a cornice piece up here, which is actually a walkway. And on top, we have these very large sculptural pieces, which are the acroteria in classical language. And they obviously have to be transformed uh, uh, drastically to be done at this scale. They're made out of aluminum. They, they're actually uh, very complex structures that sit on the roof of the building. Um, in order to produce them, these, this is the first we had 
three inch equals a foot models out of paper, which we then expanded up into, uh, these are made out of sheet aluminum with, with a, actually a steel framework backup. Uh, so it was actually, an, an, it's, it's a medieval sort of blacksmith way of, of making, uh, expanding materials. Uh, uh, through the use of models, making patterns and then making them out of other, other materials. This is the modeling of these figures, which were done in, in larger and larger uh, scale until you actually had this a plaster mock-up of the final figures. This is a, a major sort of uh, construction problem just to make the ornament for this project. Um, the plan itself, the building itself is, is quite rational. I think it has a base which has uh, central services in it with theaters in the bottom, and um, there's, there's a children's room that occurs at, at the lowest level on one side. There's, um, above that, it's the main circulation desk at this point, and the ind indices at that point, a series of standard floors that occur here. Ceremonial spaces on top over the center is a winter garden, which is part of the program of a, uh, a covered inside space, and there's restaurants that occur on the top floor too. So, <laughs> just um, quickly, the, the idea of the exterior is to embed the outside, what normally would be core elements in a modern building inside the middle of the floor, they actually occur on the outside of the building, which give you this kind of relief that occurs on the outside. Um, the, the service areas, all the, all the staff areas that are back here, they're lit by a service corridor in the back, which is where that curtain wall is, and the center has escalators which feed the center of the building. And the basic way the, the building's developed is, is a very small grid, it's, it's like a, loft building like a, it's actually like a department store. We sort of decided that the department store as a, as a kind of typology made sense because the, the, um, the people, the whole idea of that library in Chicago, unlike New York, which, which is like a research library, the whole idea is every book was available on a shelf. Anyone coming off the street could, should be able to find the building, should be able to find their book off the shelf. If they'd be on the floor, they shouldn't have to talk to anybody. It was, a, it was a kind of a wildly sort of democratic idea of a library, which what Chicago's always done. The ground floor has entrances from three sides, mainly from the State Street and, and Congress, the main entrances, and this is the service side here. The bottom has a, a public theater and a kind of uh, museum space at this point. Uh, going up, there's, this shows you the typical floor again over here. This is the uh, second floor where the children's room is the uh, main indices at this point, and the top has the winter garden, which is in the center, which has a glass roof and lights, the uh, surrounding uh, workspace, which are the administra administrative uh, space, the library, and there's a walkway all the way around the outside where you could look out over the roof over these historic buildings. Um, briefly on the inside, there's, there's a hole in the middle of the lobby, which looks down onto the history of the civil rights movement in the United States, which was a 1% for art project. The theater is, is a kind of simplified version of a, of a, of a, a rather elaborate kind of theater. Um, the typical floor, these are the indices, uh, is, is an open loft space. It's, it's essentially uh, completely off open and has the furniture arranged differently on each floor. There's specialized study areas that occur in, in, around the outside, which, which are fitting into the undulation of the outside wall, group study areas. And within the space of the library itself, you have um, scattered uh, throughout the building in, in, a kind of any, in a kind of quite free way, you find small reading areas. There's a wide variety of places to, to study here. And the escalator moves the people up through the building much like a department store. We had specialized areas for children which had their own furniture and were designed at a different kind of scale. The winter garden's here with the glass roof and the windows for the administration overlooking it. And this is the walk way that runs around the building, which gives you the view into the, into the entire kind of region around the building where the historic buildings are. So at this point, another, another sort of aerial photograph. This shows you uh, at the point in 1991 again, and it shows you the park uh, development here. The Art Institute is down, here's the fountain in here, the Art Institute is down in here, and the railroad yard, yards are still intact. This is our library sitting here in the middle of this kind of historic building district. And this is the next project that we were involved with, which is the Millennium Park project, uh, which is again now a further development of, of the lakefront park, which if, as you remember was 
uh, supposed to remain ever open and free. So this is covering up the last piece of railroad track. And, and I must say this is like a slightly different idea uh, for a public space um, because at this point the park had, been, had re really been a realization of Burnham's idea which is kind of a passive park with trees, places to sit and read, uh, some baseball fields and things, but there's nothing uh, along the lines of a kind of entertainment, an enter entertainment district. So this is now I guess a sort of 20, 20th, 21st century idea of um, um, public amenity which has to do with, uh, in the end, I suppose, tourist, tourist trade. So this is also a kind of a place to attract people to come to Chicago and when they come to Chicago, give them something to do. It has uh, a major band shell piece here by Frank Gehry and it has uh, a sculpture in here by Anish Kapoor and there's a, um, there's a very uh, amazing sort of fountain at this point, which draws a lot of people to the water. It's a water fountain, and there's a bridge by Frank Gehry that goes over the, the highway at this point to attach this piece of park here. So it's a very intense usage. It's been in incredibly successful. So when we started working on the project, uh, the project had been en envisioned. This is sort of an interesting uh, ver vision of how the world works in Chicago. So this. Had been the, the mayor. The mayor decided he wanted to have this park, this Millennium Park, and so he he talked to John Bryant, who was, who runs major fundraising things in Chicago, and he asked John Bryant, "Wouldn't it be wonderful to build the, over the railroad tracks and have this park for the for the Millennium?" And John Bryant said, "Okay." So then they began to look for people to might pay for it because all these projects are now public uh, private money combined, and Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill was awarded the project, and they laid out a sort of 19th century park, uh, much like the other side of, of, of the park on the south side, and it had a, a formal flower garden, a series of gardens across the front, a kind of war monument piece here which was reconstructed, and these were supposed to be exhibit spaces that occurred in here. Um, we had been on another site um, uh, up until now, and uh, what, we, what, we're, what we were asked to do was to see if our theater, we had a theater which is on another site with, which from a developer that a developer had owned who actually had, had given, uh, taken the site back from us. So we were looking for a home, the city was looking for sites for us, and I was asked if this, if we could fit the theater uh, in this position here. This was actually meant to be a rehearsal, a rehearsal um, facility that actually produced no income but actually occupied a, a big per percentage of the site. So uh, since we had donors and we had a set of drawings, we agreed to look at it. And, and as it turned out, it could, it could fit in there. So um, we began by thinking about this as an extension of the, uh, this is before Frank Gehry arrived. So this is, a, this is, this is the, a, a, an extension of Burnham's original plan as an attempt to sort of finish the park off. Um, However, as, as, uh, as the project developed, um, this is, it's a very complex sort of um, sectional idea. Here's the road up here, which is up three floors. You can see in the elevation here, here's the road coming up from Michigan Avenue. So this is all underground. It's essentially, you know, most of it's underground. And this is the, this would be the entrance piece here. So this is our tiny entrance piece. This is the theater, our theater here, our stage, and it backs up on Frank Gehry's stage in this point here. So as he worked on the scheme and developed his, his scheme, um, we were going to meetings uh, with friends of the park. And the friends of the park are the people who protect the parks in Chicago from people who want to build things in them. So um, we went to a lot of meetings, some of which were quite acrimonious. And uh, we started out with a, with a theater that was above grade, it was sort of up here. And uh, over a series of months of negotiation, we were sort of pushed down to where? This is, we're, at this point, we're like, the, the lake level's about here. <laughs> so this is, this is uh, dangerous territory. So um, the, the building has a very uh, sophisticated double wall system and pumps that keep it dry. And, uh, and uh, we were, the, the owner was, was, um, concerned and uh, we were concerned about how much money it would cost and uh, and then uh, Frank had developed a very sort of simple 
idea in the beginning, he had a sort of grid that supported speakers that distributed sound. And then he had a very low kind of piece here so that it wouldn't look like it was too far above ground. And um, as it developed, though, Frank after did, Frank did this very modest, modest scheme. And then the, the, the owners said, well, no, you can't. You have to, we need something much more sculptural and interesting, you know, like something like Frank Gehry would do. So Frank Gehry um, responded by doing something that, which, which is actually quite amazing, which is built on top of this. And uh, they managed to have their building um, uh, declared a piece of sculpture and not, and not, a, uh, and not a building. So meanwhile, we'd gone through you know, months of negotiation, and our building was, was underground. This all goes back to the Montgomery Ward, the original Montgomery Ward lawsuits to try to keep things out of the, you know, they kicked the Illinois Central Railroad Station off this very site. So um, we, um, we finally came to an agreement, and they started construction. Uh, they built the garage around us, and we had to fit it in, so it was a very difficult site to work on. Um, the plans, briefly, I won't go through these in too much detail. Essentially, this is the little entrance piece here, the little box that pops up. And there's stairs in that position that go down. And, and you enter at, the, you enter at um, catwalk level, and then you go down, which is actually quite of interesting. Being underground, you avoid all the problems of the massing of a theater with no windows. You actually just enter on the top, and then you go down. Um, as you go down, you go from the balcony, the balcony in position here, and the the full house here. So the, the program of the, of the theater was quite simple. Um, the owner, the, the owner had, a, had an interesting take on this that, um, that uh, the, you know, any kind of the trappings of a traditional theater wouldn't be good because it's supposed to be five minutes after I finish up. Um, so it shouldn't have any the trappings of a traditional theater. This should be, in order to be truly democratic, uh, uh, this should be, uh, totally un, un sort of symbolic or, and, or, and, and un, um, un uh, hierarchical in any way. Every seat should be exactly the same in terms of the performances. You get good, good sound, good sight lines, uh, no boxes, nothing that would suggest any kind of class system. So um, we, we complied with that. And um, out of that, the, we, we ended up with a building which has this, a very simplified frame, so it actually, in a way, it's not too dissimilar from the Art Institute, which is like two blocks to the south. It's just, a, it's not a classical frame, it's, it's a sort of a minimal frame. Uh, it has glazed openings, and inside, uh, you're not allowed to have a sign in the park, so it has a Nevelson sculpture, uh, which was a stage set for an opera, which is used as a sign. And then the stairs go down, and there's a system of lighting in here uh, that designates the area. So as you go down, you go from yellow to green, to blue as you go down, so you can ident identify the layer. And it's sort of a, a Flavin-like uh, light system. Uh, it, I suppose it's kind of ornamental, ornamental system for this building. Um, so as you go down, when you get into the, into the theater itself, uh, again, there's no color in here at all. It's all gray. And theater lights with, with colored gels actually light the walls. So you can change the interior lighting. This is from the balcony looking down. The balcony is lifted high. It's, it's raked very high, so you have dance. It's, it's a multi-use multi theater. And the idea, I should just finish up by telling you, the idea of the theater, which is actually quite amazing, is that there's theaters in Chicago that were playing in old movie theaters that had very high rents, very bad performance space. This is a, a, an attempt to allow these people to maintain their kind of business status uh, by having a, a facility they can rent for a fairly low rate and get in and out of quickly. And so we started out with like 13 companies. They now have 40. So it's actually been a kind of roaring success in the end. Uh, so in the, in the close up, this is sort of the last piece of the lakefront in Chicago. This is uh, Frank Gehry's um, uh, large band shell here, which, which is an amazing piece of work in the sense that it is a sculpture. It actually activates the entire lakefront park. So in a way, it's, it's an amazing sort of piece of work, I think. There's a beautiful. Uh, garden here by Catherine Gustafson, which has elements of, of, of sort of classical things, but they're scaled differently, and it's obviously not a classical, not a classical setup. Here you have what the last vest vestiges of the Skidmore classical plan. Uh, however, there's the, the what's called the Bean here, which everyone comes to see, uh, which is a great success. Always crowded with people. And they, these are two towers with. Uh, 
which has photographs of citizens of Chicago chosen randomly, which look, look across a, a, a pond here and a fountain spot out of their mouths after you see the face for three minutes. So it's, a, it's actually an amazing piece of artwork. And kids uh, run around here. It's like a beach. They have, to, they have a towel concession there now. And they ran a, uh, a bridge back to the Art Institute. So this is the last piece of the Art, Art Institute. This is uh, Renzo Piano's edition of the Art Institute, which has some sort of semblance, I suppose, to a classical pavilion in this point here. And this is the axis that we had actually sort of figured out would make sense. This is the axis that runs through to our wing at the back. And so these connected together. So you have this continuous connection of, of cultural facilities that occur right off the loop in Chicago. This is obviously a whole different idea of what a park is, but I think it has something to do with the 21st century. I think it's amazingly successful. I think as a, as a, as a kind of a piece of art, it's also a new vision of art, which I also think is very successful. So when you go back to the Art Institute, this is the original plan, the, the stairs in this position here, the bridge over the railroad, our cross axis, which runs through here, and then this is Renzo Piano's axis, which runs out to Millennium Park here. So with this project, they actually finished the, the lakefront park. It took them uh, from 1836 to uh, 1996 or so. So it took, it took 160 years to do, but actually through the help of sort of private and public funds uh, and a kind of will of the, uh, of the combination of the people and the people with the money, it, it somehow managed to happen. So I guess it's a happy ending in the end. Thank you very much.